Welcome to the first of five video lectures on Shakespeare's tragedy, Hamlet. Uh, so in this first video lecture, we're going to cover act one uh, as best we can, as much as a word, a word like cover can apply to a play like Hamlet. Um, but we're gonna try to establish basic plot, basic character, basic setting elements uh, for a first or second time uh, reader working through the text. Um, so again, Hamlet, um, we'll be working through the, f with the Folger edition of the text, and you'll see I've got that both um, in front of me in print form, and I've also got it on the screen for us, and I'll be referencing the text throughout these five video lectures. When I read a passage, follow along with me, um, either in a, a print text or just along on screen, but, but read those words as you go. So, All right, so, so I'm going to talk about Hamlet in this video lecture in Act 1, from the frame um, as as a as a as a ghost story, from the through the lens of the the idea of a ghost, and I think that's part of the appeal for a play like Hamlet, for Hamlet itself. That, this is part of the reason I think people like Hamlet so much and have liked it for so long. It's a ghost story, and who doesn't love a good ghost story, right? Uh, so so we're gonna jump into it from that frame first. Uh, we'll come at the play from other perspectives as well and think about it through other lenses but we're going to start off by thinking about it as a ghost story there's something wrong in hamlet we're going to get the the line later there's something rotten in the state of denmark that that's going to come up a, a little later right um and the very first line of the play establishes that sense of foreboding so we meet two characters bernardo and francisco these two characters only appear in this first part of the play, in this first scene, and then they sort of disappear. But they're helping establish that frame. And their first lines of the play, Bernardo's first lines, who's there, is quite a famous line, quite a famous way to begin a play. Who's there, right? Suspicion, sort of a question of what's going on, these two castle guards don't know if they can trust one another. We know from their language it's cold, uh, it's 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 winter time. We know it's the middle of the night, and we know that they're they're watching. We're gonna find out in just a moment. They've seen a ghost recently, right? So people they they are on edge. People in Denmark, where the play is set, are on edge as well. So let's let's look at these first lines. Bernardo says, "Who's there? Nay, hey, answer me. Stand and unfold yourself. Long live the king." Bernardo, he recognizes his voice there, right? He. You come most carefully upon your hour. So Francisco and Bernardo have spooked one another. This is the changing of the castle guard, right? Um, you come most carefully upon your hour. Tis now struck 12. So lots of little clues Shakespeare always gives us. What, what time is it? The clock just struck 12. It's midnight. And this is the time that the guard changes. Um, Francisco gets to go to bed, as we see. Get thee to bed, Francisco. And Francisco says, for this relief, much thanks. Tis bitter cold. So we know it's it's midnight. We know it's bitter cold. And I am sick at heart. Have you had quiet guard? Not a mouse stirring. Well, good night. So so the ghost apparently hasn't, hasn't appeared yet um, prior to midnight. But we're going to get in just a moment. We're going to get to where the ghost does appear. Uh, so let, let's kind of scroll down and get there. So we get Horatio and Marcellus come along. Um, Horatio is a really important character. He is going to be around the whole play, right right up until the end. Um, and he gets some, not the last lines, but some of the last lines of the play. Um, so Horatio is a super important character throughout. And he is Hamlet's, um, I, I think for our purposes, let's let's say it's, he's Hamlet's best friend. He's his closest friend, certainly, that we get to meet in this play. right? So Horatio and Hamlet are, are best friends. And Horatio has been told that there's, there's a ghost roaming the castle walls after midnight at night. Um, but but like many of us, Horatio isn't inclined to, to believe that there's a ghost. Um, so he needs to see it with his own eyes. So let's scroll down just a little bit further. We get to about uh, line 27 or so. Marcellus is explaining. Um, Horatio says, "'Tis but our, our fantasy, and will not let belief take hold of him." So you, you it's, it's not real. I oh, know you're you're making this up. I'm here. I'm I'm going to prove you. I'm here to prove you wrong. And Horatio, he says he says this. Tush tush, twill not appear. Right. So so these three guards. Um. And in this at this point we've got um Barnardo and Marcellus. 
Francisco's left. He's gone to bed, right? So we've got the three of them doing the watch. The two guards are here, uh, and and now Horatio. Um, and, and keep in mind the, the different levels of, of class that we're talking about, too. So Horatio is a friend to the prince. That means he must be a member of, of, a, of a more elite class than the castle guards would be. But still, there's enough. You know, Horatio is an interesting character because he sort of seems to bridge every other character in the play in interesting ways. Um, so he can talk with Hamlet or the king just as easily as he seems to be able to talk with these ca castle guards. Um, Horatio is a fascinating character. With lots more on him to come. So they're waiting, the three of them, cold, cold, after midnight, on the castle wall, castle somewhere, somewhere in the ramparts of the castle. You, you know, as a director, you get to decide how to how to make this come alive on stage. But in my imagination, I've, I've got them sort of standing on the castle wall, looking down, looking around, looking everywhere into the darkness, waiting for the ghosts to appear, um, or at least Bernardo and Marcellus, Horatio isn't expecting much to happen. Uh, so they're waiting. They've seen the ghost. And then all of a sudden we get the, the ghost appears, right? Enter the ghost. Marcellus, peace, break thee off. Look where it comes again. And the same figure like the king that's dead. So it looks like the king that's dead, right? Wait a minute. So this is some more news we haven't heard yet. The king that's dead. So the king just died. The old king just died. Must mean there's a new king. That's, of course, the, the important part of the story. We're going to get there in this video lecture as we work through these, these, um, these passages. All right, let's keep going just a little bit further. Um, is it not like the king? Um, let's see here. Where did I... I marked where I wanted to go to next. Let's keep scrolling quickly. Um, let's see. And I think that's that's it. Act one, scene one. I think that that's that's kind of enough. Um, so really, the the key takeaway: you've got these these characters seeing a ghost, and Horatio sees the ghost too now, right? And that sets up what's to come at the end of Act one, scene two, where Horatio and Marcellus are going to reveal um, the the what they've seen to Hamlet. So that's the come. So now we're moving inside. Um, act one, scene two moves inside. So before it was nighttime, it was bitter cold, um, and there was a ghost roaming around the castle. This has a different feel to it suddenly. And now we're inside, and we're to, I think we're to imagine um, some sort of a feast maybe that's just happening. We're inside, or, or we're just inside the throne room, but we're inside. It's, it's warm again. Um, there might be a little, I don't know if festive's the right word, but there is a sense of, of uh, seriousness. Um, maybe might be a, a better idea than festive. Um, the king is addressing court, and, and the king, the new king, starts uh, the conversation. So we've seen the ghost of the old king. Here's the new king, and his name is Claudius, and he's married to Gertrude. More on that in just a moment. Gertrude is is, is complicated. Every every character in in Shakespearean tragedy is complicated, but certainly Gertrude is is very complicated. Um, we've got Polonius there. He's one of the advisors to the king. Lots more on him soon. And his son Laertes, and also there's Hamlet. Uh, Voldemand and Cornelius are very minor characters. We're gonna we're gonna get to them very quickly, but kind of gloss over them. So the king is um, he's dealing with his international problem with Voldemort and Cornelius. Um, there's a guy named Fortinbras. Um, Fortinbras is a relatively minor character, but he appears in um, four of the five acts of the play. Um, and he sort of is this, this ongoing presence in the background of the action. He kind of represents what's happening on an international sort of scale, right? He's what's happening... Um, the, in many ways, Hamlet, I think, is, is the more, most interesting part of Hamlet, right? is the domestic part of the play. This family thing that's happening with the old king dead, the new king who's taken his place. They are brothers, by the way. Um, Hamlet, his mother Gertrude. All right, we're getting to all that. But 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 there is some stuff going on in the background where Fortinbras would like to invade and take over Denmark. Um, and, uh, and uh, well, well, we'll get to that. It, that that also is, is complicated. Anyway, lot, lots more on that. that that's a whole probably other video lecture trying to go through um, Fortinbras' character. So for th this series of video lectures, we're going to kind of gloss over him. Um, but at some point when you're reading the play again, um, spend some time with him or do some research on him. He's worth coming back to. But first get the domestic part of the story, the family part of the story set up. Now, King Claudius, um, younger brother to the former king, younger brother to the ghost, is telling, um, dealing with some different problems. So he's got the 
the Fort and Brust thing that we, we we touched on briefly, and now we've got his his um, advisor Polonius and his son Laertes next come up before the throne, and the king says, "Okay." So we saw here the the uh, Voldemand and Cornelius exit, and then the king says, "And now Laertes." This is line forty three. Uh, so follow along with me while I read this. And now Laertes, what's the news with you? You told us of some suit. What is it, Laertes? You cannot speak of reason to the Dane and lose your voice. What wouldst thou beg, Laertes, that shall not be my offer, not thy asking? Right? What do you What do you need, Laertes? What's up? Um, and and it's important. Laertes is a college age student. He's been off to college in France. When the old king died, he came back to his home country. Um, when the when the new king got married um, and marries um, Gertrude, so Hamlet, so the, the queen had been the, the queen to the old king Hamlet, Hamlet Sr., if we will, not the, the Hamlet who's the plays named after, but his dad, Hamlet Sr., she'd been married to him. And she immediately got remarried to the new king, to her, his younger brother, um, and his queen, again for a second time so so laertes needed to come back for that marriage coronation lots of things you know when, when power changes hands uh it's an expectation that people come and and show fealty um show respect to those uh, a coronation a royal marriage those are times when as nobility you're expected to show back get get back to court um and show your allegiance um, and your your that you are trustworthy, right? Um, that you're not plotting something else. Everyone comes back to court for this to show that allegiance. Um, so Laertes has done all that though, and he's ready to go back to school. So this is line 52, uh, uh, act one, scene two, line 52. My dread Lord, your leave and favor to return to France. From whence though I, from whence the willingly I came to Denmark to show my duty in your coronation. Yeah, now I must confess that duty done, my thoughts and wishes bend again toward France and bow them to your gracious leave and pardon. So I, I just, you know, he's just asking to go back to school. Uh, the king says, do you have your father's leave? He says, yes. And, and he lets Laertes go. We're gonna get back to them in the next scene um, and get to hear Polonius and Laertes say their goodbyes to one another. And I've got lots of thoughts on that, but that's just a few minutes. Next though, Claudius, the new king, younger brother to the old king. I'm gonna keep emphasizing that because that's, that's really important. You've got to get that straight in your head, this family relationship, right? So the old King Hamlet, we saw his ghost just a moment ago or the night before, or at least the, the characters in the play saw it, right? Old King Hamlet died. His wife, Gertrude, they had a son. That's Hamlet. He's the star of our play. He's the main person we're talking about, right? Uh, the old king dies, marries. Um, the, 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 his younger brother becomes king. So it's an interesting question. Why didn't Hamlet become king? We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, I think that's a, a really interesting and important question to get to. Um, and now the queen has remarried the younger brother. And, and if that... If that strikes you as just a little bit icky, <laughs> like it does me, then you are on the right track to understanding what's going on in Hamlet's head. Um, and, and getting to understand what's, what's in Hamlet's head, what he's thinking, what he's doing, um, understanding these events through his perspective, that's key. That's what we're trying to do in the study of this play. Um, so, so yeah, so if you're thinking, oh, my, my mom... And my uncle just got married right after my dad died. Ew. Um, yeah, you're on the right track if that's what's going on in your in your your response to that right now. But 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 Claudius doesn't seem to realize there's a problem with this. He doesn't, or at least he's not going to acknowledge it um, in front of all these people um, in his throne room or at his banquet table, wherever we decide to set Act One, Scene Two. So he looks to Hamlet and he says, "How is it that the clouds still hang on you?" Right, and, and this is again, just like in the first scene where we heard um, the clock has struck 12, it's bitter cold. We get these clues about how, about the setting and about the characters and how people are behaving. Um, the clouds hang on Hamlet and the king, the new king, King Claudius, notices this and he says, why, why are you sad? And, and Hamlet always has a smart aleck response to everything. So, so if the king is gonna talk, especially, especially with Claudius, especially we're gonna see here, um, 
in the next act in the second video lecture with Polonius too. Um, always, always these sort of smart aleck answers. So, so the king is talking about clouds. He says, no, not so, my lord. I am too much in the sun. And of course, sun's a fun word because in English, sun, the sun in the sky, sounds exactly the same as the son of the former king. So already sort of, a, what's, the, what's the problem? Well, it's just that I'm a son. You know, which, which implies I had a dad once, and he's gone. So we we can he, the, the wordplay, the wit that Hamlet uses. He's always doing this, and it makes him a very, it makes him likable and unlikable at the same. To hear him as an as an audience member sitting in the audience and hearing this, it um, when you get it, it gives you some satisfaction. I don't know that I'd want Hamlet using his wit on me to make me seem foolish, though. So we'll get to some better examples where he makes people seem foolish. So, yeah, the queen comes in. She also is worried about her son. Good Hamlet, cast thy knighted color off and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Um, the knighted color, we're going to see um, Hamlet's been wearing black. Ever since his dad died, he keeps wearing black. He's still in mourning. He hasn't taken off. He, he always wears black. So that's why she says, take off your, your black clothes. And, and look, let thine eye look like a friend. Be, be happy, right? Do not forever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowest tis common. All that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Aye, madam, it is common. If it be, why seems it so particular with thee? Common again. Everything, oh, not everything. Lots of Hamlet's words have sort of this double meaning, right? So common means, yeah, that it's, it's the... The common thing, the everyday thing that we do, right? We Everyone has to lose their parents, or, or most of us at some point have to lose our parents. That's the everyday common thing. But also common kind of has a negative meaning. I think of the 21st century word, maybe a word like basic, right? Basic is kind of, has can, can have a very negative connotation depending on who's saying it. So we, we won't go too deep into that, right? But common can also mean, you know, you're just, just a common you know, it, it, can, it can have a negative connotation. Anyway, we won't go through all, all of, of uh, Hamlet's double meanings, but just to get a sense, he's always doing these double meanings. Seems, madam? Nay, it is. I know not seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother. His inky cloak, because he's wearing black. Everything, you know, we get these clues, textual clues, he's wearing black. Um, nor customary suits of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of forced breath, no, nor the fruitful river of the eye, nor the dejected havior of the visage, together with all forms, moods, shapes of grief that can denote me truly. These indeed seem, for they are actions that a man might play. And, and this is important too. Shakespeare, Hamlet, is always talking about... Um, there's all these sort of meta-theatrical pieces where we're talking about players, actors, pretending to be a, a person, pretending to be a character, right? Um, these are at, and, and Hamlet himself is playing a part, or he's going to be. At this point, he's, he's pr through Act 1, he's pretty genuine. Till he meets the ghost and finds out the truth about what happened to his father, he's just, he's just sad. Really, really sad. Um, and I think that's, that's, he's wearing black. He hasn't stopped mourning. He's not over losing his dad. He's not over the fact that his mother remarried so quickly. He, he's struggling all with all of this. Um, his mental health is a mess at this point, and he's trying to pick the pieces up. But then you've got people like the king um, who aren't very supportive. So let's take a look at this. Uh, the king says, "'Tis sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these mourning duties to your father. But you must know your father lost a father." Everyone's lost a father. That father lost his. That father lost. Lost his. Your dad lost his grandpa, too. It, it's, and the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. So, yeah, it's, it's right. When your father dies, for a little while, be sad about it. But, but, to persevere in obstinate condolement is a course of impious stubbornness. To, to linger out this long still being sad. We're going to find out later. It's been a couple of months and he's still sad. It's like, can I, eh, I, I think you can be sad for more than a couple months. And then, and then this is kind of a horrible, tis unmanly grief. That's a, that's a horrible thing to say to a son that's lost his father and is still sad about it. That's not very manly. He's kind of saying, yeah, your dad just died two months ago. Man up. Stop, stop being sad about it. Um, all right. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of skip over the rest of this passage and I want to jump to um, after everyone exits and Hamlet is alone on stage. Um, this is a this is the first of Shakes of uh, first of Hamlet's soliloquies. 
Um, we won't, I, I, just for the sake of time in the video lecture, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, but but do re, do make sure you've, you've already read before the video lecture, read it. Um, go, this is worth going over a second time in full on your own too. Um, Hamlet is addressing the, simply the very notion of what it means to be alive. Why why are we why why endure suffering? Why do we keep going? Um, and that's going to be a question all the way through uh, Act Three um, into Act Four, and I think we finally get some form of an answer in Act Five to this question, right? And he's saying here, oh, that this too too sullied flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself resolve itself into a dew. I wish I could melt. Or that the everlasting, meaning God, or that the everlasting had not fixed his canon, his laws, against self-slaughter. I, I wish God hadn't said that suicide is a sin. I, because I'm, he think he's that deep into his, his, his crisis right now inside. Um, that he is. He's, he's contemplating suicide at this point. Oh God, God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. This is a wonderful soliloquy, um, and for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over the rest because I want to try to keep my, my video lecture at about 30 minutes, um, and we still have so much to do. But, but, but go through this, and th this is the key stuff of getting inside Hamlet's head, his soliloquies. When he pauses and he's alone on stage, he pauses from his conversation with all the other characters and he just looks at us as the audience or if we've got the book in front of us as the reader. Um, this is the, this is the, 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 there's lots of good stuff, but this is some of the really, really good stuff, these soliloquies. So, all right, jumping on um, act one, scene three. Oh, oh yes, also important in Act 1, Scene 2, um, at the very end, Horatio comes and says, Hey, I saw a ghost. Um, my lord, I think I saw him, meaning the king, because they're talking, the old king, yesternight, last night. And that gives us a sense of time, too. So that was last night, now it's the next day. Tr keep track of time. There's lots of clues that help us do that. Um, saw who? My lord, the king, your father, the king, my father. And of course, Hamlet, now, you saw a ghost? Of my father, and we're going to get to that in Act One, Scene Four. But real quick, before we do that, um, Act One, Scene Three, I want to uh, look over. So zooming downward here, um, we get to Act One, Scene Three, and and we've got Laertes and Ophelia. I haven't mentioned Ophelia, yet. Ophelia yet. Um, Ophelia is is um, one of Shakespeare's best female characters, most interesting female characters, um, and here she is. She's um. Uh, daughter to Polonius. So we kind of have two families going on. We have Hamlet's family, and then we've got the family of Polonius and his two kids, right? And we, we met Laertes. He's going back to France. Here's Ophelia. And, and, and it's interesting here. Uh, we've got Laertes giving advice to Ophelia. He's getting ready to leave for France, and he knows, and here's where the, the two families intersect, um, Hamlet and Ophelia are, are dating. Uh, they are boyfriend and girlfriend in some degree. It's not. It's, it's not ever made explicit exactly what what that relationship is, and it's been pretty secret because Hamlet's not supposed to have a girlfriend. He's a prince, so he's supposed to uh, marry the person that his father tells him to. Um, all right, more on that in a bit. Um, so, so here is the advice Laertes says, knowing that that Hamlet can't marry you. He says, perhaps he loves you now. And now no soil nor cotel doth besmirch the virtue of his will. But you must fear his greatness way, because he's the prince. His will is not his own, for he himself is subject to his birth. Because he was born a prince, he has to do what he's told by the king. He can't just marry anyone he wants. He may not as unvalued persons. Isn't that that's an interesting way to that's what I am, right? That's what all of us are. We're all unvalued persons because we're not nobility. But but uh, but also that's that's kind of nice. I get to I get to pick who I want to marry. So I don't know. I, I guess I, I'd rather be an unvalued person perhaps than someone who has to uh, obey, you know, has to marry who I'm told. He may not as unvalued persons do carve for himself, for on his choice depends the safety and the health of the soul of the whole state. Um, and then just a little bit um, more, I'm gonna skip just a bit, uh, bit ahead down to line 33. Then weigh what loss your honor may sustain. So if he's not gonna marry you, he's only with you for sex. This is weird advice from a brother to a sister, at least my, my 21st century uh, sensibilities, this is weird. Um, weigh what loss your honor may sustain if with, if 
with two credent ear you list his songs if you listen to him singing you love songs or lose your heart or your chaste treasure open to his unmastered in his unmastered importunity oh dear um yeah we'll, we'll just kind of leave it at that um Laertes says don't be with Hamlet and especially don't have sex with Hamlet. Protect your virginity. Um, weird, weird conversation. All right. And then we get, um, you know, Polonius has this advice um, next. So then Polon now this was that, that earlier was just Laertes and Ophelia talking. Then Polonius comes on. Polonius is kind of an old fool. I, I want to like the father figures in, in, in Shakespeare. And there are some good ones. Um, I don't know. This the, Polonius is an old fool. And listen to the advice he gives us. And this this advice is pretty famous. Um, you know, he his advice is um, beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in it, bear it that the opposed may beware of the. Just real quick, a tangent. These side notes. So um, these little marks here. When you see an apostrophe, it's just like our apostrophes. It means that it's being. Um, it's a contraction. So bear it that the oppose, and this little mark means opposed, give it an extra syllable to make the, the verse work. So you see lots of these little marks, so I'll let them throw you. They're, they're, they're just as easy as, as words like t turning cannot into can't, or do not into don't. Um, we still do it. Um, they're just, we just have some different ones. Bear it that the opposed may be aware of the, so as so the advice is, try not to get into a fight, but if you do get into a fight, make sure you win. Oh, that's, sort of toxic masculinity and it's 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 you know um here's another one neither a borrower nor a lender be for loan off loses both itself and friend so if you're for your friend needs 10 bucks for something don't loan it to him because i don't know it's just the i don't know um and then of course this is one of the, the famous lines from from the play to thine own self be true which which, which read a certain way is good advice right be, be true to yourself but I think sometimes when I hear it with all the other advice, it seems to like worry about yourself and not others. Like don't don't want a friend some money if they need it. Um, I mean, obviously in excess that's bad. Um, and, but but to thine own self be true. In excess is bad too if you don't care about anyway. Um, and then so so Laertes gets his advice from his dad, sails off to France. He's going to be gone now until Act Four. Um, and then when we get to Act Four. Um, or when we get to Act Four, we'll 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 come back to him. So, all right. Um, and then and then it's Polonius on stage uh, alone with Ophelia. And Ophelia was kind of quiet as the goodbyes were said, said her goodbyes. And and uh, now though Polonius knows that that uh, Laertes was talking about something, maybe it was something about Hamlet. And it's like what what was being said. And he is completely don't get involved with Hamlet. Oh. And we hear from like father, like son, the same kind of advice, like father, like brother, the same kind of advice for Ophelia. For Lord Hamlet, believe so much in him. This is line 132. For Lord Hamlet, believe so much in him that he is young, and with a larger tether may he walk than be given you. And Ophelia, do n in few, Ophelia, do not believe his vows. Don't trust Hamlet. He's only using you, and especially don't have sex with Hamlet. Um, and, and she gets this advice. And at the end here, she's going to say, I will, I shall obey my lord. All right, we get back, we come back to Ophelia um, in Act 2. We'll come back to Laertes in Act 4. Let's stay now, let's go back to the ghost story. And again, the ghost story is the, the, the really good stuff, I think. I think it's the stuff that makes this um, really good on stage, really interesting. So we've got, it's cold again. Now this time Hamlet's out there with Horatio um, and Marcellus. Is there right? Um, so one of the guards, um, Bernardo and Francisco, are gone. They don't. They don't ever come back into the play. But Marcellus is here for just a short time, and then he's going to disappear too. Um, these are the minor characters, kind of who are setting the stage for the the major ones, Hamlet and Horatio. So it's cold again. What hour now? It think it lacks of twelve. So it's almost twelve. It's almost that midnight, that that time when the ghost um, appears. Um, and we're going to skip down um, just a bit. Um, Enter the ghost. Look, my lord, it comes. Now, now, the thing about ghosts is, what are they? And I think this is an important line here. Be thou a spirit of health or goblin damned. Bring with the airs from heaven or blast from hell. Be thy intents wicked or charitable. Thou comes in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. Um, this could be a spirit of health. It could be some sort of an angel, right? It could be good. Or it could be a, and a goblin in Shakespeare's time is a, a little different. I mean, think more of a demon, 
You could be a demon who's damned in hell, and you've come to trick me. What are you? And Hamlet's not going to know for sure until we get to Act 3. Um, in Act 3, he's going to realize, he's going to be convinced that this is a, a spirit of health. It's, it is really who he, it, it's not someone lying to him and pretending to be the spirit of his dad. It really is. Um, he'll be convinced later in the play. But at this point, he's not. And that's really important. Tuck that away. Hamlet's got to figure that out. And that gives us some insight, too, into what his, his thinking and his actions, what he's doing. All right. Um, he's going to follow the ghost. Um Horatio and Marcellus are concerned, and I'm going to jump all the way to Act 1, Scene 5 now. Act, uh, scene 4 and Scene 5, unlike the other uh, scenes in Act 1, they just kind of lead right into one another. Hamlet gets himself alone with the ghost. Um, and he's, he follows him off stage, they re-enter stage, um, they lose Marcellus and Horatio for a short time, and the, mar the ghost says, mark me, listen to me. And he's going to tell them the story, so I'm going to kind of zoom ahead just a little bit, um, and here's the truth. And this is where the ghost story part of the play comes to uh, the, the climax and the most interesting part. The ghost is going to reveal how he died. Now Hamlet here, line 41, act 1, scene 5, line 41. Now Hamlet here, tis given out that sleeping in my orchard a serpent stung me. So that's the story. The story everyone knows is that I got stung by a serpent out in my garden um, and that's what killed me. But, but. So the whole ear of Denmark is by a forged process of my death rankly abused. So anyone who's heard that story is, has been lied to. They've been abused because they, they've had the truth withheld from them. But no, thou noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life now wears his crown. And it's, it's yeah, it's... Uh, it's Claudius. The, the, the current king killed his brother so he could become king. And that's the stuff of Hamlet. That's the whole bit of Hamlet. We get it in um, the, you know, the Lion King too, right? Scar kills Mufasa so he can be king, right? It's always sort of the, the evil little brother. Um, yeah, so, so anyway, Hamlet at this point says, Oh, my prophetic soul, my uncle. So he, he, he understands exactly what his father told him and even says, My prophetic soul, I knew I kind of knew somewhere inside that that might have been the thing that happened. I couldn't. Now I've got. Now I've got the proof, though. Oh, but he doesn't know if he's got the proof because it still could be a goblin dam, someone there to trick him. But the ghost goes on to explain what happened. I, that incestuous beast, that adult. The, I'm sorry. I, that incestuous, that adulterate beast, with witchcraft of his wits, with traitorous gifts. Oh, wicked wit and gifts that have the power so to seduce one to his shameful lust, the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. Um, and then the, the, the story too, um, the actual story of how did he do it, right? So the serpent that sung him in the, in the, in the garden was his brother sleeping within mine orchard, my custom always of the afternoon upon my secure hour, thy uncle stole with juice, juice of cursed Hebena in a vial, Hebena, some kind of poison. And in the porches of my ears did pour that leprous, the leprous distillment whose effect holds such an enmity with blood of man that swift as quicksilver it courses through the natural gates and alleys of the body. And with a sudden vigor it doth posset and curd. Think of cottage cheese curding, right? Like eager droppings into milk, the thin and wholesome blood. So did it mine. And, and the poison kills him. Um, and this is how he died. And it's also very important too, um, this line. Thus was I sleeping by a brother's hand of life, of crown, of queen at once dispatched. Cut off even in the blossoms of my sin. That, we're going to talk more about that in the, in the next couple of video lectures. He didn't get a chance to repent of sin. So he's sent onward um, into this purgatory-like place instead of getting to go to heaven. Um, and in some ways that's, that, or in many ways, that in this world um, that Shakespeare's created, that's far more cruel than just killing him if he would have killed him while he was praying, right? And we're going to get to that later in the play. Um, we'll talk more about that. All right, one last detail that I want to squeeze into this first video lecture before we close and that is that Hamlet is going to demand, when the others uh, come on stage, he is going to demand, I didn't highlight the part I want, he is going to demand that the others keep it a secret. Um, so this has to be kept secret so that he, nobody else knows what Hamlet knows. And that's important to keep in mind throughout the play too. Horatio knows there's a ghost. 
but it's but but we don't hear Hamlet explain exactly what the ghost said. Although we, we're going to know by Act Three that he has told him, so that's coming. But Marcellus, who's going to just kind of disappear after this anyway, it's a secret. Um, and we also know Hamlet explains to them that part of the thing he's going to do now is he's going to put on an antic disposition. He is going to pretend to to, to be mad. He's going to feign madness. All right, and that will be the stuff of Act 2 that we'll start up um, Act 2. And that will be our next video lecture. So, so thank you for your attention to this video lecture for Act 1. And we will pick right back up in the next video lecture with Act 2. Thanks, everybody.